Now, the particular not a chorea that I'm interested in today is, in a way, uh, very much in the background of, well, it's in the foreground of what most of we, of what we, we professional anthropologists are concerned with, but in the background of everyone's practice, even whether you are an anthropologist or, or you are not. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? And that is that what we do is we we make publications. We send things out into the world in some way. And we do this in particular sort of packages, genres. I'll be talking here about this, uh, about this book, which is a rather splendid book. And I've always been very impressed by it and stand in awe of. Uh, but I'd like you to have a sense of the strangeness of this process. So let's just contemplate some of what happens here. I'll okay, drive the next slide, please. Uh, can you read that? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> well, I can tell that someone has been able to read it anyway. Okay. Um, so what happens is that we produce something which is, uh, in part, has to be a description of some actual people, some actual place, someplace else. We translate that into uh, squiggles on the page, and we send that out. It goes through process, it's printed, and then it's handed out, it's put onto a market. And so what ends up is, is, is that we uh, produce an engagement of someone else's imagination through the squiggle on the page, which is an incredibly skilled and hard and uh, uh, admirable achievement, actually, for the most part. So just to have a contrast here that I have in mind about how strange this process is. Go to the next slide, please. If we were to think of this artist's representation of social life as being something of this kind, and thinking also that it would be moving, constantly moving and uh, changing, and that what we do and we do feel moves, we try to understand something of this kind. That is to say, something of incredible complexity with different viewpoints, many, many different viewpoints, many different attitudes, uh, many different experiences are involved. Uh, we take something of that kind, and then, I can I have the next slide, please? And then we transform it into something of this kind. So there's the book. Uh, and what's, and the key bit here I want you to note is we went from that complexity to something that has a part one, and then the first part of part one, and then it has the first uh, section of part one. Of the, uh, of the part, and then it has a paragraph, and it carries on. So what's happened is that something quite marvelous has happened here, is that we have um, taken some very complex experience that we've had, uh, some very interesting but very complex information we have, and we've transformed it into something that someone somewhere else will be able to reconstruct for themselves in some way by reading the squiggle on the page. Then, uh, and then I'll do this in the I had emails from uh, an American monk, for a, from a former American monk in Sri Lanka to tell me that the book had become a kind of uh, rough guide to becoming a monk in Sri Lanka. <laughs> and I have to say that was Plan, but ironically, <laughs> didn't really object. And I was especially impressed that uh, someone who used to live a life of greed and confusion now has become a forest monk of Sri Lanka. And I, as a person who still lives a life of greed and confusion, can only say, great stuff, wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> uh, can I have the next slide? There was another a dimension here, which I was uh, 
I didn't take on board at the time. I was invited to have the book translated into Sinhalese by a representative of the then president of the Republic of Sri Lanka. And uh, I, I thought that was a bad idea. I wasn't quite sure why, but I felt this was uh, a politician getting involved, and I wasn't quite sure what was happening, so I hated and hummed and hawed, and it never happened. However, I then later, much, much later, much, much later, discovered what the agenda was. The agenda was, as you can see from what the uh, president of Sri Lanka had to say here, was that he wanted my book published in the Sinhalese to stop all those nasty Buddhist monks complaining about him. <laughs> That's what it came down to. So all I can say is that here are ironies and viewpoints piling on each other. Uh, most of them, in these cases, things far beyond what I had in mind, but a result of my actually putting it into the form of a book. Uh, and my message from this part of my little discussion here is roughly this, that we have to have the assumption that what we do is a straightforward, uh, positive, clear message, which is in some way is an explanation or interpretation of some way of life or circumstance, which would be understood and archived so that it would be understood not at present, not only at present, but also afterwards, so that it has a kind of solid, real, information-like reality. On the other hand, it is inevitable and inescapable that however much what we do has that characteristic, nevertheless, at least from my experience, or my, my recently at the discovered experience, uh, it turns out that we don't know what the hell is going to happen. Actually. Now, it's not quite entirely like that, because one of the things that we do commonly is we write ironically, by which I mean we incorporate into the way that we write, into the way of writing which is meant to be univocal, archival in character, we, uh, we write such a way that we include in the way we uh, talk about things, people, and experiences, uh, many of the different viewpoints that are actually present. Could I have every slide, please? So what I wanted to explain was, in essence, that uh, we, in the act of publishing ethnic, ethnic research, we're trying very hard to do one kind of thing. And we have many, many super examples, excellent examples of how that can be achieved. We have come if you're trained as an anthropologist, or you do a course in anthropology or something like that, that we are trained to be able to see a world of a great variety of, uh, of descriptions of different forms of human possibilities, what pe people can become, how they can understand them themselves and each other. And we can treat that and we're very happy to, and we ought to treat that as a great archive, a great wealth that we have, on the one hand, a wealth for reflecting on us and on others. On the other things, on the other hand, things can go to hell in the handbasket. That is to say, because we put this out there, because we publish it, then all kinds of things can happen. All sorts of imaginings can happen. Uh, I'm sure many among you have had things happen with your research that is much hairier than has happened to my research. Uh, we can't control that, and this is ironic, and it's ironic precisely in the sense that what we might have thought is a relatively straightforward point of view it ends up being layered over with other points of view, other readings and others' experiences, such that it may, it may become ultimately practically to ourselves, unrecognizable. Essentially.
essentially what I'm trying to do here is to suggest to you, um, can I have the next slide please, is that if we begin confronting experience of incredible complexity and trying to make something relatively, to find our way through it, a way through it which is clear and helpful and can be archived. On the other hand, what often happens, and which perhaps we ought to also aspire to, and which some of us have been able to achieve, is we can achieve a skilled piece of, a skilled piece of art that will portray the irony, will help us to reflect on this, on, on the complexity of this whole experience of ours and others. So there might be something, could I have the next slide please, in which we've turned that into something of this kind. And I think I'll leave you right there. Set of actions. 
different levels of description of what's being done, which you brought out very nicely with the Linhart example of the Dinkra. So I was just offering as an analytic tool, which would take forward your philosophical interest and, and orientation, the idea that one can have a thick description of what is said in the anthropological text, where there are different intentions within that text on the part of the anthropologist, both attempting to describe what is there, but also perhaps trying to communicate something different um, in the subtext, as it were. It's, it's just a, as a way of having an analytic tool to bring together the idea that all those intentions can be present, and partly the work of analysis is to find out, if one can, what all those intentions were. That's an ideal task. And the link that I understood, that I understood, that I was making to your use of irony, is that irony can be thought of as a complex speech act of that sort, where not all the intentions of the speaker are immediately apparent to the audience, or indeed sometimes to the speaker. But that's a further point to this idea of thick description. Okay, I think, yes, now I do understand it like that. that um, uh, that's put very nicely. Uh, I think uh, the, the concept of irony I've come to use is probably uh, becoming a little bit too, a little bit too uh, overwrought here. But it's something of this kind that when um, the quintessence of irony as a practice uh, is a Socratic in the sense that when um, the quintessential original founding act of irony, at least as far as Western philosophy is concerned, is Socrates saying, I don't know, I am ignorant. Okay? I agree. And uh, there are various interpretations of that, of course. But the interpretation I understand that makes the irony, and, and, and the word iron uh, in, in Greek is for someone who dissembles in that way, someone who's a wise man who acts as if he's an idiot or something like that kind. But uh, I think what it's come to mean more to the point is, I'm, is that Socrates was in essence saying, I'm ignorant because there is so much to talk about and so much to understand here. There's so much uh, that needs to be part of a continuing process of understanding here that when I say I am ignorant, what I mean is it, it doesn't come to an end. It's, it's endless. And um, one of the slides which I had to take out here was a slide which expressed that for anthropology in particular, uh, we in the UK have had to produce all kinds of paperwork over the last 20 years describing what we do. And one of the terms that we had to use, the alien terms from outer space, was learning outcomes. So I was offered the chance to explain what I imagined the learning outcome of, a, of taking a degree in anthropology ought to be. And I proposed to my colleagues that we say that the students should come out more confused than when they appear the first time. And the reason for that would be because the world is so full of people who know the way it is and who act upon what they think they know the way it is, that what we need is many more people who are confused and don't know the way it is. So uh, my understanding of irony in that sense is that it's always an opening onto something more profound, always more interesting, and always, as you explained, a more complex way of understanding what's happening. And thank you very much for